Okay, so welcome everybody to the second half of my image compression talk. Um, reviewing the basic problem, we'd like to represent an image using as few bits as possible, but we'd like to do it in a way that doesn't give up too much coding quality. So some of the questions that we've asked and will continue to ask are, how well can we expect to do in principle or in theory? How might one compress images if we're willing to accept some loss? And then finally, and we'll get into that today a little bit, um, what should we do if we want an exact bit for bit um, identical replica to the original? So today I'll briefly review some of the main points from the previous talk. And then I'd like to um, make some final points about lossy compression and then move on to lossless compression. So with lossy compression, we have to know how well we're doing. And it's not a perfect measure, but it's broadly used. It's unambiguous, and it's useful within a coding scheme to assess different versions of parameter settings, et cetera. It's called the peak-to-peak signal-to-noise ratio. So let's say we adopt a mean square error measure, such as what, is, what PSNR is based on. Uh, we could ask, well, what's the best we could ever do in a lossy compression setting? And so last time, we mentioned that there's this theoretical curve called the rate distortion bound. The important point here is that if you believe in the model, that is, if you believe in the probabilistic description of your source, so now this is a very abstract setting. The source could be an image. It could be speech samples, what have you. If you believe the probabilistic model, then, and for, with respect to some meaningful distortion measure d, there exists a theoretical curve. So this is the rate axis, the number of bits, per observation, typically. And this is a distortion axis. The rate distortion function tells you how you could do using the best possible coder, coding uh, in very long blocks of observations. And basically, you can't be down here. So that's a theoretical result. Last time, we went over probably the what I'd consider to be the main framework for lossy compression. It's transform coding. And some of the techniques that we uh, call by different names are actually closely related to transform coding. So it's worth briefly reviewing. We start off with a block of input observations. So in the case of image compression, this would be uh, the result of tiling the image into non-overlapping blocks, typically 8 by 8 blocks. So we have a 64 uh, vector if we're thinking in one dimensions or if we're doing two-dimensional separable. Uh, processing or even non-separable processing, we'd have a 2D block. We apply an orthogonal transform, which is invertible and preserves uh, energy. We, by doing that, we've compacted the energy into relatively few components. We can then allocate bits to the components that need the most. We may or may not try transmit some information as side information. We reconstruct the uh, transform coefficients at the other end inverse quantize them, uh, inverse transform them, rather, and come up with an approximate replica of the original. So this was kind of the thing we talked about most last time. Yeah? Uh, what horrible things happen if you have overlapping, uh, like a transform that starts to overlap? Oh, so the question is, do horrible things happen if there are blocks that overlap, transforms where the kernels overlap? And in fact, I'm glad you asked. No, good things can happen. Um, people sometimes do that on purpose. and. I think we may have mentioned a little bit about that last time, but we'll get into more of that now. Yeah. OK, so one of the things we talked about was a choice of transform. We restricted consideration to linear transforms to, in fact, transforms with the orthonormal bases. We asked, well, if we want to optimize the energy compaction, is there something we can do that really explicitly optimizes that? And then under certain assumptions, we saw that the Carhun and Lev transform, also called principal components analysis, uh, is a way of doing that. But that's data dependent. And if you were to use that in a coder, you'd have to then have some means of synchronizing with the receiver to use the same transform. And that would probably mean transmitting uh, the information needed to specify that transform. So we saw that the discrete cosine transform is kind of a one-size-fits-all approach that has pretty good energy compaction. We took a look at that also in the frequency domain to try to interpret that in terms of a, a spectral decomposition. Excuse me? Yep. What is a positively correlated source? Oh, it means when, uh, in the simplest setting, the one-dimensional setting, uh, if I have adjacent samples, 
uh, they could depend on each other. And if they depend on each other in the sense that if one value is high, then the one next to it is high, and when one value is low, the one next to it is low, then that's positively correlated. You can imagine a situation where they alternate. That's a different kind of correlation. Um, OK, so we settled on the DCT as a reasonable choice of transform. Um, we also talked a little bit about generalizing it in the framework of filter banks. But then once we've got these transform coefficients, we've got the energy compacted into as few components as possible. Now we're going to actually convert these transform coefficients into bits. So this is where the digitization happens. And we considered two different approaches, one where the quantizers have a fixed coding at the output. So every quantizer output gets a certain fixed number of bits. And then another approach is when the uh, Quantizer outputs have a variable number of bits, so that's an entropy-coded quantizer, which um, if you look only at the quantizer performance in distortion versus rate, will work better than the fixed-rate scalar quantizers. But more importantly, there's a simplification that happens. If we were to use a simple scalar uh, fixed step size quantizer with the same step size for all of the subbands, for all of the uh, transform coefficients, and be careful when we code the output of the quantizer, uh, that the entropy coder knows that the different coefficients can have different activity levels. Okay, but we use the same step size for all of the subbands. And if we do everything else right, then we get an implicit bit allocation. Implicit in the sense that the coefficients that have a lot of information or a lot of energy, that is coefficients that are exercising a lot of the quantizer um, levels. Uh, will have a greater output entropy and therefore will be allocated more bits implicitly by the entropy coder. So if you account for all of that and you add up how many bits are being used by which coefficients, then we saw last time that that's a nearly optimal thing to do, and that was the Lagrange multiplier uh, argument. Yep. Can you say anything about how that would compare to the rate allocation you might get for conveying PCA components or parameters? Right. So. If I were to do principal component analysis, right. So the question is, how does the rate allocation here compare to what one might do uh, if, if you're using PCA? Um, so with PCA per se, that, that speaks to the transform. So that speaks to what you're doing to allocate, uh, to, to compress, to compact the energy. Um, don't you still have the same questions? I mean, isn't it sort of this? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, in describing the actual data-dependent PCA that you did, whether or not there's kind of an equivalence in terms of the net amount of information that you have to convey. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether you did the data-dependent PCA or you're oh. kind of doing the optimal allocation of bits in the quantized space. So I'm just trying to figure oh, right, out right. whether or not they really end up with equivalent metrics of information. Yeah. Um, Right, so the, the extra that you spent up front in communicating the PCA transform, um, do, do you get some of that back because you don't have to transmit as much? Uh, right. No, that's a good question. I, I don't know. OK. Um, we could interpret the transform as a critically sampled filter bank. And we observed last time that, uh, first of all, this is a one-dimensional process. And typically, when we think about applying this to images, we might do it separately. So first do all the rows and then do all the columns, for example. So um, each of these filters has some uh, convolution kernel. And then we're going to subsample the output of those filters. And we can think in the case where the lengths of these filters are less than or equal to uh, the subsampling factor, then this can exactly express the uh, application of that transform matrix, the, the block transform. It's interesting to ask, though, what happens when the filter length is greater than the subsampling factor, or equivalently, in this case, the number of subbands. And in that case, we have a situation where the uh, kernels are overlapping uh, to the adjacent blocks. And one version of doing that is called the lapped orthogonal transform. And it was proposed as a means of, one, getting better energy compaction, but more importantly, to try to um, reduce the blocking artifacts that people typically get when they're doing transform coding. OK, um, this is still by way of review, which is why I'm going kind of fast through these uh, first slides here. We also said that 
Well, besides thinking in terms of decorrelating um, a covariance matrix for a correlated source, we can, again, think in terms of this multi-rate signal processing framework where we have different filters processing different parts of the frequency spectrum. So here's a hypothetical power spectral density for a one-dimensional signal. It's a discrete signal, so the spectrum goes from zero to pi, and then it has its mirror image. The idea here is um, I've got a non-flat spectrum, which, which corresponds to a correlated source. I analyze that into these different subbands, resulting in B. I can then subsample these subbands, and the effect of subsampling is then in the, trans in the Z transform domain is to, um, is to map, remap where 0 and pi are. So it effectively stretches these little pieces to fill up the full band. And since we started off with a pretty small band, um, if the spectrum didn't change a whole lot in that small band, when you stretch it to the full band, it'll kind of look flat. And if you have a flat power spectral density, that corresponds to an uncorrelated source. This is a slightly different argument from the decorrelation we talked about in the Carhun and Loeb transform, in the sense that there we were talking about decorrelating um, different uh, coordinates in the, in the observation vector. Here we're talking about decorrelating uh, coefficients in the same um, position in your transform, but over different blocks. So this is decorrelation over time, if you like, or over space in the case of, case of image processing. And when we optimized with the Carhun and Lev transform or approximated that with the DCT, the decorrelation we're talking about there was uh, decorrelating among different transform coefficients. So there's two types of decorrelation that were going on. OK, there are a couple of different ways we can improve this basic scheme. Uh, one, which we just mentioned, is to allow the convolution kernels to extend beyond the, blo the block boundaries to try to get at some of those blocking artifacts that we sometimes see. And another thing we can do, again, appealing to this idea that we want to compact energy into as few components as possible, we could try to do a non-uniform spectral decomposition where we put greater frequency selectivity or frequency resolution in those parts of the spectral density where there's a lot of detail, where things are changing very quickly. Right. One way of doing that is to apply a simple two-band uh, critically sampled filter bank uh, in a tree structure. So each block here, each, uh, so the analysis block here has inside it a low pass filter and a high, high pass filter, and then each is followed by a subsampling by two. And then we cascade that. So at the end, uh, we'll see that this band right here gets processed using only a single stage. So it's a high pass filter followed by a subsampling. The lowest band has several stages, and each time we apply the subsequent processing, the effect in the original time domain is much longer. So the equivalent filter that was used in this low band, if we were to express this as a parallel structure, and, we, and there are identities that let us do that, we'd see that the equivalent filter, if we were to express this as a parallel structure, would be very, very long, would have a long spatial region of support for the low-pass low filter. And that makes sense because we'd like to be able to have that low-pass filter then uh, be very active in the interior of large regions. But when we're at edges, we'd like to be able to adapt very locally to those edges so we're not smearing the effects of those edges uh, far away from the edges. All right, so there's a practical reason for doing this. When we arrange a decomposition in this form, um, historically, I think that was first done uh, with quadrature mirror filters um, back in the 70s, uh, and then later, uh, w which only sought to uh, eliminate aliasing uh, distortion, to cancel aliasing from one band to the other. Um, but then later on, people discovered that you could have perfect reconstruction filters, and they tried to get smart about the exact shape of the filter kernels and their relationships from one band to another, put it all in a nice mathematical framework to talk about um, uh, optimal uh, localization in, in um, space and spatial frequency. And, and there's a large uh, mathematical theory around wavelets that, that talks about that. Okay. So if I apply it separably in the horizontal and vertical dimensions, then I could um, 
get a decomposition that looks something like this. So in the first stage, I do a, a low and high decomposition uh, horizontally, and I do it vertically also. Then I take the low, low band, and I recursively subdivide that into an arrangement that looks like that. OK, any, any questions so far on this setup? Yep. So what color do you do all this? Oh, um, so last time, briefly, we mentioned that um, we don't have to we don't have to have the same uh, acuity or resolution in the color domain. So what people typically do is they'll decompose into illuminance and chrominance space like YIQ or something like that. Then they'll uh, work real hard on the luminance, and then they'll do something a little sloppier on the chrominance. And from a perceptual standpoint, that works pretty well. Uh, is, is it just arbitrary that you don't do any recursive decomposition on the low high and high low squares in this picture? Uh, right. I, and, and, okay, so the question is, is, is there a reason why we don't do um, any decomposition on these components? Um, so I guess, the, I guess you could argue that you might gain a little bit from doing that. Um, but I mean, experience has shown that this is a reasonable thing to do, and ultimately, the decomposition that you're going to use is the one that, in practice, gives you the best energy compaction. OK, um, so before I go on, uh, to segue into it, I want to reflect on transform coding a little bit, because there's um, a lot of little pieces that go into transform coding that kind of all work together in a nice coincidental way to make the thing reasonable. But when we really try to look at its foundations, I think it, it illustrates um, some questions. It, it brings up some questions. So basic question, does the transform make the input more compressible? And that's an unanswerable question. I guess in principle, it uh, probably doesn't. But in practice, it does. So what do I mean by that? So given that the transform is invertible, it hasn't really changed the information in the original input. So in particular, the rate distortion function um, of the input, if, if it exists, you know, with respect to the right models, et cetera, whatever that is at the input, that's the theoretical bound on how well you can do. Well, that's got to be the same right here, because you haven't changed the information in the, in the signal. So in light of that observation, what is the role of the transform? Right. So as we observed last time, the transform actually doesn't compress. It simplifies the subsequent compression. And uh, to say it simplifies is always with respect to something that you think is simple. So it simplifies compression if what you're going to do is the things we talked about. And um, more than that, it allows you to kind of get away with the simple processing we talked about, the scalar quantization, et cetera, um, and still do pretty well. So it kind of all works well together. It puts the energy in predictable places, so you can take advantage of that statistical regularity that's latent in the, in this, in the image. But it brings up a question, well, what if I'm willing to do something more complex than simply treat each transform coefficient as a separate entity that I'm going to scale or quantize? Right? Well, that brings up the general question of vector quantization, and I'll get back to the question of applying vector quantization to a transform coder. But let's talk for a minute about vector quantization in the abstract. So we already have this idea of taking your input image and tiling it up into different blocks and then trying to encode the different blocks separately. So let's hold on to that idea. But now we're going to take each input block as a point in a high dimensional space. So if it's an 8 by 8 block, then I've got a point in a 64 dimensional space. I'm going to build a code book of representative vectors in that space. And to code an image, every time I get one of these input vectors, I'm going to map it to the closest entry in my code book. Yep. Just to clarify, so, uh, so far you've been talking about uh, coding each block independently of each other, not carrying data from one block to the next. Uh, yep, yep. Right. So a very simple-minded approach. Each block is independent. We're not carrying data from one block to the next. So of course, in practice, we'd put in refinements that understands that these different blocks came from the same image and, and things like that. 
But conceptually, we can imagine um, this scenario where now if we have a set of n reproduction vectors to transmit um, which one it is, I need uh, log base 2 of the number of vectors if I'm using a fixed rate code. Um, or I could do the same thing I did with scalar quantization. I could have a lot of different um, representative codebook entries. And it doesn't hurt if I have codebook entries where, where no input point will ever be. Um, as long as I use a variable rate code, which would then uh, not uh, allocate any bits to those things because they never get used. Right? I mean, it would have a long code word for those things that never get used, but they'd never get used, hence you'd never pay that price. So as long as the entropy of the codebook output is constrained, um, you're OK. So you can have a lot of, uh, you can have a big codebook. OK, so how do you build one of these codebooks? So let's say I gather a bunch of images that I think are representative of the type of images that I want to compress. So if I have natural scenes at a certain resolution, I collect a lot of them. If I have document images, I collect a lot of those. I prepare, um, I tile them all up so that I have a lot of vector observations. And I then initialize the codebook with some fixed set of uh, entries. Um, let's say I have 50 codebook entries to start out with. I'm going to iterate this procedure then. First, I take every training vector that I observe and I assign it to its nearest codebook entry. For each resulting set of, um, for each resulting group then, so each codebook entry has its own group, I then recompute the centroid of that group and I use that as a new value of the codebook entry. Right? And then I iterate. I return to step two and I keep going until this thing converges. Okay, that's called the Lloyd algorithm. Uh, it's also called k-means. It's also used for clustering. Okay. Okay, um, so that's basically vector quantization in a nutshell. Uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't figure prominently into existing standards, although it does seem to be used in some proprietary schemes. So unlike transform coding, vector quantization in principle can approach the rate distortion bound. So if you were to just ask, well, how good can transform coding be in the best case scenario? In the best case scenario, transform coding is ultimately limited, at least the version that we described, is ultimately limited by the fact that you're using scalar quantizers. And scalar quantizers aren't optimal even in the cases where you've really, even in the case where you've really done a good job of decorrelation. Vector quantizers can fill up space more efficiently with representative um, code points. Scalar quantizers are kind of stuck with a rectangular lattice and vector quantizers can use a fancier lattice. There's another advantage that vector quantizers have, which is that if you haven't done that great a job in decorrelating, well, that's where they really shine, that you can really do well, because then you can take advantage of the nonlinear uh, dependence that uh, may exist between these uh, coefficients. OK, so let's go back to transform coding, and let's ask, well, why do we use scalar quantizers after doing the transform instead of vector quantizers? OK, so the transform coefficients are uncorrelated both spatially and across uh, frequency bands. Spatially because of the spectral argument that we gave and across frequency bands because of the original uh, argument behind principal component analysis. So if there's not a whole lot of correlation, the main advantage of vector quantization is, is usually in the statistical dependence between these things that make up the vector. And if there's not a lot of dependence, then there's not a lot of advantage in using the vector quantization over the scalar. There's still this, these other advantages, but most of the advantage is in the dependence. So we can therefore ask, is there any role for VQ in this type of coding? And I want to do a little thought experiment here. So here's some two-dimensional data. It's a scatter plot of x and y pairs. And let me ask first, um, so this is x and this is y, right? And they're just, these are the points that are kind of observed. Okay, and let's assume that successive pairs are independent. So each point is an independent observation of this vector source. Um, 
are x and y correlated in the mathematical sense of correlation, the expected value of um, x minus its, minus its mean times y minus its mean? Any takers? Yep. Right. They're, they're, not, they're not correlated. They're orthogonal. Um, so does that mean that I wouldn't gain anything by uh, coding them jointly? So if I, if I know that uh, x is 0. 0.5, do I really not know anything about y? I know a great deal about y. Right? In particular, y had better be either here or there. So here's an example of a contrived artificial signal that has no correlation at all, uh, but has a great deal of statistical dependence, nonlinear dependence. And vector quantization would work pretty well here. So going back to the transform coding example for transform coding of images, do, is there some phenomenon that's analogous to this going on among the transform coefficients? And the way I want to visualize that, oh, let me just quickly add. Um, the orthogonal linear transforms that we've considered, you know, with these orthonormal bases, can be thought of as rotations of the, the coordinate system. And so if I rotate this coordinate system, it doesn't help me at all in this example. OK, so you can actually visualize uh, transform decomposition. In this case, it's a subband realization, so that multi-rate signal processing realization. And I've done a 3 by 3 uh, splitting where I use um, bandpass filters followed by a subsampling factor of 3. And I'm just putting them in the positions that correspond to their, spa their um, spatial frequency locations. Okay, so that's the low pass signal, and that's the high pass signal. And I'm visualizing these by scaling the amplitudes and putting them on the range 0 to 255 so I can see them. So if we look at this band, for example, does that tell us anything about this band? Is there some sort of dependence going on there? Visually, it looks like there is. And so it'd be nice to be able to exploit that. It's kind of interesting if you were to actually estimate the correlation by taking the average value of the products of these coefficients uh, and averaging that over the right uh, things that you want to average over, whether you're doing spatial decorrelation or, or spectral decorrelation, um, you'd see that that is actually very close to zero. So uh, it really is uncorrelated in the mathematical sense, but in the intuitive sense, there's a lot of dependence. So this suggests that we could um, benefit by joint coding of the transform coefficients, or in other words, vector quantization of the transform coefficients. OK. Um, so one way to approach that, that statistical dependence, is if I were to go back to this picture of doing this hierarchical um, decomposition, uh, coarse to fine decomposition, um, or rather I should say tree structure decomposition. It's been empirically observed that if there are regions in a location in the low-pass image that don't have much energy, that the corresponding regions in the other uh, bands also don't have much activity. So that's the basis of a technique called embedded zero trees. And that's a way of exploiting the dependence, in this case, in activity, not in actual pixel value, but in the activity of the local region across the bands. And so that has been exploited to advantage. So that's that's sort of a refinement on transform coding that happened in the 80s that, uh, or early 90s in this case, that um, really made a difference. So if you want to look that up, it was uh, described in a paper by Jerry Shapiro. And there are a whole bunch of things that that paper did that I think are really neat. Um, from the point of view of this subject, though, the, this talk, um, the most important contribution is that it provided an effective way of getting at this nonlinear dependence and exploiting it to pretty significant advantage. OK, I want to, um, unless there are any final questions on lossy image compression, I want to move to lossless by popular request, actually, from last time. OK. Because normally the order in which you'd explore these would be reversed. You might first start with lossless and then go to lossy as a generalization. Um, OK, so the problem now is that the decompressed image, we insist, has to be exactly equal to the original 
Okay, quick question. Why would anybody want lossless compression? These, are these uh, CCD, sen what the photons that happen to go on a CCD sensor um, bin, are they so sacrosanct that we've got to preserve those precise values at all costs? Or? Ah, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, and then I'm also going to ask why might lossless <coughs> compression be hard? But seriously, does any, maybe you were serious. Medical imaging. Medical imaging, okay. So maybe there's some legal reasons that you want things to be lossless. Yep. I think it's because you want to be able to edit the file, save it, re-edit it, and keep working on it. You don't want the losses to build up. You don't want generation loss from subsequent code. Yep. All right. So if you just want to eliminate the variable, so if you're doing scientific imaging and you just don't want to have to um, guess about whether the compression is making a difference in your results or not. Yeah, good point. Okay, I'm going to um, give an example of lossy compression again. This is a, a bitmap from a document image, a binari binarized document image. And that's the original, and that's what we would get if we were to losslessly compress it. Now, for document images like this, there's a special technique uh, of lossy compression that tries to figure out what these shapes are and replace these little connected components by their idealized shapes. And if we were to do that, we'd get something like this. So this is a lossy compression version of the top image. So which do people prefer if you had to read a document? Probably the bottom one, right? So, but lossless compression would insist on doing that. And, and let's say this, let me ask a different question. Suppose this is my original image in case A, and this is my original image in case B. From a lossless compression standpoint, which would be easier to losslessly compress? Now, treating this as the original in one case, or this as the original in one case? B, right? B is somehow simpler. It has less um, strange um, artifacts. It looks more regular in some way. Okay. Okay, let me also ask why might lossless compression be hard? So here's a, a, a sheet fed scan of a thin page from a book. And you can see a lot of uh, bleed through from the other side. If I look at the least significant bit of that image, so I take the least significant bit and plot it out as an image, scale it from 0 to 255. That's what I get, all right? So if I do a lossless compression of this image, I've got to losslessly compress everything in it, including the least significant bit. And so some of my code uh, rate is going to this image. And if I were to then look at the two least significant bits, well, it looks a little bit better, but there's still, there's still a lot of noise there. And if I were to do a good job in binarizing it, then this would be the thing that I start with. Um, and I don't mind losslessly compressing this guy. I could do pretty well. Uh, and I probably, from a practical standpoint, get most of the information I care about. Okay, so let's go into lossless compression basics. And the basic idea is we've got some discrete source and we want to represent that source without any ambiguity or loss uh, using a few, few, as, uh, few number of bits as possible. The way I'm going to do it is the more probable images or more generally observations get short code words, and the less probable ones get longer code words. OK? Does that seem reasonable? Ah, but why not use short code words for everything? There's not enough of them. Good. So let's try to formalize that. Um, we'll also ask uh, how long is the ideal code word. And actually, I, I won't uh, try to argue it. I'll just present it. Um, the best code length is the minus log of the probability with respect to some probability model. Um, and on average, if you were to use uh, that code length, you'd get the entropy as the number of bits that you spend on average. So then another question is, given a probability model for images, one that we believe, so that's kind of a hard thing to get a handle on, but imagine, hypothetically, we had one. Uh, could we design a coder that achieved the best rate possible with respect to that probability model? 
So that's an inter interesting question to ask. So these are all questions here, except the best co-length is kind of an assertion rather than a question. OK, so um, to get at the notion of lossless compression from a slightly different angle, let's look at kind of a statistical argument that says that compression to a certain amount is possible. And so I want to consider this idea of um, typical sets or typical sequences. The basic idea is that if you have some discrete random variable and you see a bunch of observations of that discrete random variable, if I were to treat those observations in blocks, so now I have a new set of observations, each of which consists of a long sequence of observations in the original space. There, there are a lot of different values of that block that are possible. So if the alphabet size is k and the block length is n, then it's going to be k to the n different possible values for that whole block taken as an aggregate. Of all the values of that, for that block that are possible, a much smaller set usually can actually happen with any significant probability. And that's kind of one of the key ideas behind uh, how information theory in general works and noiseless source, co source coding in particular works. So this effect becomes stronger when we let the block length get larger and larger. And the idea here is that the law of large numbers is uh, at work here. So let's consider an example. Let's say I have a biased coin uh, with the probability of heads being 0.1, and I'm going to flip it 1,000 times. Intuitively, we would expect that I would get about 100 heads in that experiment. If I ask, what is the probability of the set of all sequences, of all all sequences I could, could have gotten that have about 100 heads, plus or minus two or three or something like that. Okay? That set, the set of sequences with about 100 heads has the overwhelming majority of the probability. If you were to just add, add up the, uh, if you were to do the, the binomial distribution and simply add up the probability masses associated with each of uh, those values of, of, uh, of k, if, if this is like a, an n choose k problem. Also, um, if, there, if you consider the set of sequences with about 100 heads, they all have about the same probability. Namely, there's going to be 0.1 raised to the 100 times 0.9 raised to the 900. That's the probability of any particular sequence in that set. So I could use, for that set, I could, for that typical set, I could use a fixed rate code. I could simply take the log base 2 of the number of uh, sequences. And the number of sequences, in this case, that have exactly uh, 100 uh, would be the log base 2 of 1,000 choose 100. Okay? So in general, I could apply Stirling's approximation um, to the log base 2 of n choose k, and I'll get something that looks like that. And that looks like the entropy, the, the n times the binary entropy of, n over k, of k over n, rather. So, well, what happens if I get a sequence that's not in the typical set? So this, this coding scheme works for everything that's in the typical set. And in this extreme case, everything that had exactly 100, uh, exactly 100 successes. But let's, let's um, relax that a little bit, and let's say we'll use a similar scheme for things that have about 100 head, uh, heads. So um, it really does cover the typical set pretty well. Well, if I get something that's not in the typical set, its probability is almost zero. So I kind of don't have to worry about it. Well, that's not lossless, though. So what do I do? I could transmit a bit up front that says whether or not it's in the typical set. If it's in the typical set, I do something really uh, efficient like this. If it's not in the typical set, I do some sort of brute force method. But the probability of having to do that is so small that it doesn't, it doesn't hurt me on average. OK, so let's get back to this question. Why not use short code words for everything? And the answer, of course, is because there's not enough of them. We can try to make that a little bit more formal um, by considering first the set of um, prefix-free codes. So um, for a code to be useful, it has to have some properties. One is it has to be uniquely decodable. That's pretty obvious. It's also nice if. Uh, by looking at a long code bit sequence, if I can just look at it and go through sequentially and sort of parse out successive code words. A code that has that property is called a prefix-free code. No code word is a prefix of another. And this is an example of a prefix-free code. So normally, if I put up a 
a listing of code words and ask, is this code any good? Usually the answer is, well, you have to tell me what the probability distribution is before I can tell you if it's any good. But I claim that you can tell me that this code is no good just by looking at it. Any takers for why? There's no zero, zero, one. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and another way of saying that is I don't need, I don't need this last uh, zero. If I wanted to have, if I wanted to have it, then I might as well have the zero, zero, one because there's no, there's no reason not to. Okay. So I can, uh, any prefix free code I can represent as um, terminal uh, nodes in a, in a tree, in an initial tree of some hypothetical full tree. So imagine taking the longest code word and uh, finding the depth of the tree corresponding to that and then uh, sort of sketching in the full tree as a hypothetical entity. Uh, all the code words would correspond to uh, leaves in uh, some initial tree of that full tree. So if L sub i is the length of code word i, then this is a craft inequality. And to see the craft inequality, note that for any node here, the contribution to the craft inequality can be decomposed into what it would have been for the descendant leaves. Right? So the less than or equal to comes from the fact that we may not use all of the leaves in this initial tree. So uh, for example, the 0, 0, 0 corresponds to this guy, but its sibling isn't used. So we could have just gotten rid of it and, and used that node instead. By using this, I'm actually um, meeting the craft inequality with a strict inequality. So it's not quite efficient. Okay. So this is a pictorial representation of why we can't have um, all of the code words be uh, simultaneously short, because if they were, uh, then these things would be too big. Right? OK, so there are a bunch of different techniques that people actually use in lossless compression. Deciding which one to use often requires detailed insight into the physical nature of the source that you're dealing with. Um, there's no compression at all. That's a special case. Um, there's Huffman coding. Has anybody here not heard of Huffman coding? OK. Um, there's sort of inverse Huffman coding, where instead of trying to reduce the number of output bits for a fixed number of input symbols, you do the opposite. You try to um, maximize the number of input symbols that get swallowed up in producing a fixed number of output bits. That's uh, called tungstel coding. Um, there's also variable to variable. So remember in JPEG, the uh, encoding step involved zigzag scanning through the quantized DCT coefficients, uh, run length encoding that zigzag scan, and then um, putting those runs into a Huffman table and using a Huffman code for the runs. So that's kind of a variable to variable uh, length coding. Then there's arithmetic coding, which I'd like to talk about now, because that's kind of a nice general technique that works, um, that allows separating the uh, coding from the modeling uh, problem and works over a broad range of entropies and can be adaptive and all kinds of nice things. So the way to understand arithmetic coding is to think of taking the whole sequence of things that I'm trying to encode. So in the case of images, I'm going to do some sort of scanning of the pixels. I have a sequence now of, of discrete observations, and I'm going to encode that entire sequence into a single number. And I'm going to send that number, and that's the arithmetic code. And I'm going to go over the details of that now. So I start off with the unit interval. I'm going to divide it up into subintervals. I'm going to reserve a subinterval for each possible value of x1. The width of the subinterval is going to equal the probability of seeing x1 in that context. Once I see the value of x1, I'm going to then commit to, commit to the subinterval that corresponds to it. I then have some new subinterval that corresponds to that value of x1. I'm going to subdivide that, one subinterval for each possible value of x2 given that previous value of x1. And I continue recursively subdividing these subintervals. Uh, they get smaller and smaller as I get farther and farther along in the sequence. And at the end of the whole sequence, I'll have a very tiny subinterval that corresponds to the probability of the whole sequence. Okay? And I'm going to have a picture that maybe just reiterates that. <laughs> 
The key observation for arithmetic coding is that this final subinterval will contain at least one number in it, which when you represent it as a binary fraction, you know, one bit for the halves place, another bit for the quarters place, et cetera, um, can be represented exactly using L bits, which is about the minus log base two of the width of that subinterval. So if you just look at the spacing of binary fractions that can re be represented in L bits, you'll see that the spacing <coughs> is such that um, we're guaranteed to fall into one of these uh, subintervals of that width. Okay. We're guaranteed that one of them will fall into the subinterval of that width. Okay. And we can build up. We can we can actually deterministically figure out what what the uh, number representative number should be, and there are a couple of different ways of doing it. Uh, one proposed by IBM and another one proposed uh, uh, later in the 80s by, um, I want to say folks in Bell, Witten, Cleary, and others. I, I, think, I think they're from Australia or New Zealand or someplace, I don't know, or maybe Canada. There are two different ways that are popular for doing that. Um, and here's a picture. So let's say I'm encoding the sequence BAC. Start with the unit interval. Its width is 1. I then observe the value b. I commit to the middle interval. The width is now p of b. I subdivide that. I get an a. I commit to uh, the first third of that middle interval. And the width now is this uh, chain rule probability. And I uh, subdivide that. And I continue. And now I see a c. And I commit to that third of that um, new subdivision. Um, so, so, and then at the end, when I'm done with my whole sequence, um, I'll pick a number in there that has a compact binary representation, and that unambiguously uh, describes which subinterval I'm in, and therefore the decoder knows what all of the uh, letters in the sequence must have been. How do you transmit the probabilities, or are they assumed to be known by the decoder? Great question. How do you transmit the probabilities in order to do this? Are they assumed to be known by the encoder and decoder? So the usual method is to agree in advance that whatever probabilities are used have to be deducible from what's already been sent, plus any prior knowledge that's known about the domain. Yeah. OK, so there's some practical issues. Um, importantly. It separates the modeling part from the coding part. So when I have a Huffman code, uh, the probability model is kind of implicit in the code. Here's a way that I can kind of really separate the two problems. I can say, OK, there's the job of the modeling unit that, whose job it is to give me a sequence of predictive distributions for successive observations. And the arithmetic coding unit is going to take those probability mass functions along with the actual observations, and it's going to produce bits. So it's a nice separation of responsibilities. Um, arithmetic coding was invented, I guess, in the late 70s. Um, there were a couple of theses. I think Frank Rubin and uh, somebody named Pasco, and then folks at IBM um, really tried to make it practical and, and really made it practical. Uh, Glenn Langdon and Jorma Rissanen. Uh, most of those patents now have expired. Um, there are some patents that uh, came afterwards for variants of the basic technique, uh, which may still be in force. Oh, cool. OK. Somebody, somebody named Pasco used to work at Park, Xerox Park. Rich Pasco. Rich Pasco, good. OK. I don't know that. OK. Um, so schematically, we've got an input sequence. We've got a probability model. Uh, and this uh, speaks to your point. Uh, we can change this probability model as we go along. Uh, but to prevent having to transmit side information, uh, we agree in advance that we'll condition it only on uh, preceding information. Okay. Okay. So here's a question: um, the arithmetic coder will give me minus log p bits. Can I gain anything by using something other than the true probabilities? Let's assume the true probability is p, and the assumed probability by the coder is q. The average code length will be the expected value of the minus log of q. And this is greater than what I would get if I'd used the true probabilities. This comes from the non-negativity of uh, relative entropy. Or you could use Jensen's inequality. 
Okay, um, how do I apply this to images? So one approach that one could use and has been used for binary images at least is to simply code every pixel in raster order and we're going to use a probability model that depends on nearby previous pixels, previously decoded pixels, pixels that are available at the decoder. So if I'm encoding X, I could use A through G as my conditioning uh, values. And why not use very large contexts? So by context, I mean everything to the right-hand side of the conditioning bar. Well, I have a data sparseness problem if I use very large contexts, right? Because I want to estimate these probabilities probably using occurrence counts. So every time I see a particular configuration for the context, I count how many times I got the different values of x, and I build a big table. If I have uh, a lot of conditioning pixels, then I've got a big table with a big index into the table. And there's two problems. One is a practical problem of storing the table, but then more fundamentally, how do I ever see enough example data to fill that table in a meaningful way? It's a sparse data problem, cursive dimensionality problem. On the other end, why don't I use very small contexts? Any ideas? Yeah, they don't give you any leverage. They, they don't have much predictive power. Right? In the extreme case, I don't use any context at all, and then I'm at the marginal entropy, which for typical images, 8-bit images, might be around 5 bits, so you don't, you don't get much. Why not use non-contiguous conditioning pixels? And there are actually, uh, people sometimes do use non-contiguous conditioning pixels, and, and you, could, you could gain something by using different configurations. Okay, here's a variant called two-level context coding. So I've got a smaller neighborhood, like the one I already showed, and then I've got a larger um, augmentation to that neighborhood. So the idea is the encoder tries the bigger neighborhood first. If it's got good statistics in the table for that big neighborhood, it uses it. Um, Otherwise, it backs off to the smaller neighborhood. Yeah? Wouldn't it be Oh, right. So the question is, wouldn't it be better, more efficient, more sensible to implement that in a multi-resolution way where you have um, a coarse resolution and a finer resolution, et cetera? Yeah, I think maybe there are, there are ways of doing that. Um, so how does the decoder know when to switch? Well, it has exactly the same information that the encoder used. It can look at the table and see if there's enough counts to make these probabilities um, reliable, and it can on its own be synchronized by making the same decision that the encoder made. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part two. So we said that the nonlinear statistical dependence, if there's statistical dependence, it's probably nonlinear between these subbands, or most of it's nonlinear. Um, and we can exploit that using the embedded zero trees idea, and there are other variants of, of that. Um, lossless compression can be challenging. Um, arithmetic coding is an efficient way of achieving lossless compression. Um, it is good for even uh, low entropy sources. It's adaptive. Uh, it separates the modeling and the coding problems. Um, and the context coding is, is one approach to lossless compression. And, um, there's a variant of, there, there's something called JBIG1, which essentially uses a, a form of context coding using uh, an arithmetic coder proposed by IBM. And I don't know if JBIG1 is broadly used. People use, usually use CCITT group four or uh, other techniques. Dan would know. The patent, yeah, right. So, right. So we agree that it's J Big One never really caught on, uh, and probably one of the concerns was uh, at the time the the proprietary interests of IBM. Okay, thanks a lot. Right, so um, for the transform part or what you do after you've got the transform code? For the transform 
You know, people have um, tried to come up with lots of different approaches to transform coding where you try to have transforms that are specific to patches and the patches can have funny shapes. And uh, in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of work in that direction. But I, yeah, I haven't actually tracked the most recent, but the last I looked, there wasn't, wasn't much. Yep. Can you comment on, on new compression standards that come out? Like I've heard of JPEG 2000, but nobody seems to use it. Oh, people use JPEG 2000. Okay. It's, it's got a bunch of different parts to it. So there's kind of the part that relates to what I've talked most about is kind of the, the wavelet coding part. And I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I think it's related to the embedded zero tree approach or a derivative of the embedded zero tree approach. But I, I don't actually know. But, but people do use JPEG 2000. Yeah. What's the standard that Microsoft is pushing? Is there a question to Oh, right, there was some email about that, right? Was that, the, the, you're talking about the thing where there's some email about it? The new Microsoft HD photo file format. HD photo, yeah, I don't know anything about it. So um, okay, well, Enrique Malvar uh, was the main force behind the laptop orthogonal transform in the 80s, and he's now uh, prominent at Microsoft, and uh, he's a very smart guy, and they've got other very smart people in that group, uh, Phil Chow and others. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they have something very good. Uh, are they going to displace JPEG with it? Uh, probably not, not, I guess. Don't know. I mean, maybe. Yep. Do these lap orthogonal transforms all take advantage of a spatial analog of time domain alias cancellation, or is there more to it than that? Um, they do uh, take advantage of that, but they also want to get perfect reconstruction, and they want to try to um, simultaneously uh, localized in space and spatial frequency. So there's a little bit of uncertainty, um, the, the uncertainty principle trade-off going on. Um, OK, thanks a lot.